So one day, I'm working in a lab in Botswana that processes samples for HIV and tuberculosis. I'm chatting away with the lab tech about my life when suddenly he cuts me off and says, you should be dead. All I did was tell him that I was living with type 1 diabetes. See, in many low and middle income countries around the world, people living with type 1 suffer from a wide range of complications, stunted growth, blindness, amputated limbs. And if a child is diagnosed with type 1, their life expectancy ranges from 20 years to less than a year. I've been living with type 1 diabetes for over 30 years. I have this sensor here monitoring my blood sugar and this here pumping insulin into my body as I speak to you all. Because of my work in Sub-Saharan Africa and Southeast Asia, I will never take for granted that I am living with this condition and that I'm still alive. See, my fellow people living with type 1 diabetes and I are locked into a dependence on medication and devices for the rest of our lives. We need them to survive, unless. I remember when I was first diagnosed at age six, the doctors told my parents there was a cure in the works. Scientists around the world were working on making stem cell derived insulin producing cells in the lab. These could be transplanted into patients and would reverse diabetes. Cell therapy, Sue. Soon, that was when the first Bush was president. When am I gonna get these curative cells into my body? I am carrying a double-edged sword. One edge is gratitude. Gratitude and a deep appreciation for the amazing innovations in science and technology that led to the devices and medication that keep me alive. And the other edge is anger. Anger that people living with type 1 diabetes require devices and medication to survive, and that these things aren't accessible everywhere for everyone. The impact of a double-edged sword lies in how you wield it. I took my combo of gratitude and anger, took stock of my life and my career, and dove into working on a part of myself that previously I had run away from. And that is why I'm here today. I believe in harnessing cutting edge innovation to develop the next generation of diabetes therapies. I have assembled a team of amazing scientists with a wide range of skills, stem cell biology, transplantation, immunology, chemistry, optics, engineering. And we are pulling together the latest innovations in science and technology ranging from nanosensors to developments in cell therapy for one big job. We call it the diabetes job. Sometimes it feels a little bit like I'm part of Ocean's Eleven, except for we're not breaking into a bank vault. We are trying to break into a new paradigm of diabetes treatment. So earlier today, I was walking around with a basketball and someone came up to me and said, I'm really excited to hear your TED talk on basketball. I know that's confusing. <laughs> I grew up around here and uh, went to high school down the street. And a long time ago, I was considered quite the basketball player. I haven't played basketball competitively since university, um, but you still wouldn't want to come across me on the court. <laughs> since then, I've worked in R&D focused on diabetes and HIV and tuberculosis diagnostics for Clinton Health Access Initiative. And I've also founded an organization in Southern Africa. Now, I'm the co-founder of a biotech company here in the US. I do have some tips, though, for anyone who was expecting a basketball talk. I feel like I have to do justice to that part of the audience. So if you're now an older basketball player, like I am, don't play defense, don't rebound, <laughs> talk a lot of smack, and shoot deep threes. <laughs> Let's get back to diabetes. We all are either personally impacted or know some of the 537 million people in the world living with diabetes. 
And I have this conversation all the time. People come up to me and they say, hey, my friend has diabetes. And I say, oh, type 1 or type 2. And they say, I, I don't know one of those. So there's actually a big difference between type 1 and type 2 diabetes. But all diabetes has to do with challenges related to insulin. Insulin is what your body uses to take food and turn it into energy for your cells. Now, type 1 is what I have and what I work on. In type 1 diabetes, your immune system has attacked and destroyed all of your insulin-producing cells. So you can't make any insulin at all. Without insulin, you die fast. So you might be wondering, type 1, insulin-producing cells are lost. Well, let's just replace them. Let's put them back if that's the cause of type 1 diabetes. It turns out that replacing cells that your body has intentionally destroyed is hard. Hard, but in theory, not impossible. And like many a pragmatic optimist that hears those words, I say, so you're telling me there's a chance. <laughs> Cell therapy. There's actually precedent for reversing type 1 diabetes with transplanted cells. People have been doing this with variable success since the 90s, using deceased donor insulin-producing cells. Sometimes they can reverse type 1 diabetes. The challenge, among many, is the issue of supply. But there are other sources for insulin-producing cells. And one is to make them in a lab from stem cells. They're beautiful, but stem cells can be a bit of a trigger word. They're often hyped as the future of medicine with infinite possibilities. And I want to emphasize, stem cells are used as a starting material to make insulin producing cells. Stem cells are not transplanted into someone as a treatment for diabetes. The great thing about using stem cells as a starting material is you aren't limited by the supply of it. You can make, in theory, as many insulin-producing cells as you need. Not to say that making insulin-producing cells is easy. There's a lot of nuance. It takes time, and there's decades of research that have made this possible. But recently, stem cell-derived insulin-producing cells were able to reverse someone's type 1 diabetes for the first time. I want to take a moment and express my gratitude to the scientists and business people that made that work possible, as well as to the people living with type 1 that are participating in that trial. It's amazing. But those cells and that transplant aren't relevant for most people living with type 1. And selfishly, they're not relevant to me. A few years ago, I was sitting in the lab of a bit of a hero of mine, a leader in the field of making insulin-producing cells. He makes some of the best in the business, Dr. Matthias Hebrock. Now, Matthias is a co-founder in the company I run today. And when I met him, the very first thing I said was, so tell me, what's stopping us from getting these cells that you work on into my body? See, I don't care that we can make insulin-producing cells in the lab. I know it was a huge milestone, and it took decades of research and a lot of brilliant people to do it. And I don't care when people reverse diabetes in mice. And while I deeply appreciate the proof of concept of using stem cell-derived insulin-producing cells to reverse diabetes in a way that's only relevant for a small portion of people living with diabetes, we aren't done. Our bodies are complex systems. There's a lot of work needed before there's a transplant out there that's relevant for all of us. Three big challenges. The first is the site, the location where cells are put today by the liver, invasive procedure. If anything goes wrong, very problematic location. And the cells aren't happy there. There's a lot of cell death. The next challenge, systemic immunosuppressants. These decimate your immune system and leave you vulnerable to infections of all kinds. To me, 
That's like trading one chronic condition for another. And finally, variable results. When people were doing these transplants from deceased donor insulin producing cells, sometimes they would transplant two, three, four times and they still couldn't reverse someone's diabetes. Other people get one transplant, diabetes free 20 years later. When I asked Matthias about the challenges with getting these cells into my body, he told me, Katie, the biggest challenge that no one is working on is these cells are essentially going into a black box. We put them in and we pray that it's gonna work. If we could only get some real time context as to what was going on, it could be a game changer. Now, I grew up in the Silicon Valley. Growing up, everyone was talking about the internet of things. What Matthias and I ended up discussing was what if we took this concept of the internet of things, real-time data, sensors, and got it to work in cells inside the body, shining light into that black box. It just so happened that from my time at Clinton Health, I knew someone who could do internet of thing type work in cells. Dr. Tuan Bodin is a luminary in the field of biosensors. He has been doing groundbreaking work since before I was diagnosed with diabetes. And he's got over 50 patents, over a thousand publications, and quite a few books to show for it. Tuan and the folks in his lab had designed biocompatible gold particles that were super small, tiny enough to fit into cells. In fact, the ratio of these gold sensors to a cell is about the size of a basketball to this room. The great thing about these sensors is that their signal is especially strong, strong enough to be detected through skin. Tuan joined us as our co-founder and together the three of us and that amazing Ocean's Eleven-like team I told you about have been working on making insulin producing cells in the lab and putting 50 nanometer sensors into them that give us real-time feedback on what these cells are experiencing. Now, you might say, sensors and cells, do you really need them to be there? I've got a sensor in my fridge that tells me when I'm running low on milk and I never use it. When it comes to cell therapy, the ability to see how someone's body is responding and how a transplant is doing is game changing. Let's get back to the topic of immunosuppressants. This is the juggernaut of challenges in the space. If we want to develop a transplant that is relevant for all people living with type one diabetes. Your immune system is supposed to be a good thing. Immunosuppressants cripple it. Your immune system protects you, but it also attacks things that it doesn't recognize like newly transplanted cells. And in type one diabetes, it can be especially problematic where your immune system attacked and destroyed cells in the first place. So there's a bit of a dance here. If you don't wanna take immunosuppressants, you need to hide the cells. But if you hide the cells and something goes wrong, your immune system can't do its job. What we need is a way to tell if anything has gone wrong with hidden cells and also to tell how well they stay hidden. This is a great job for a nanosensor. Now, this type of technology is actually relevant for other cell transplants as well, and for research generally. But my team and I are laser focused on moving the needle or uh, removing the needle. Sorry, I can't resist. In the diabetes space. Now, what about that last challenge I mentioned, cutting around by the liver and putting cells in that less than ideal location bit. Can we do anything about that? We've got some technology up our sleeves for that too, literally up our sleeves. 
we combine our real-time data-generating insulin-producing cells with a cocktail of proteins that make them super robust and give them an edge. So if the cells are Popeye the Sailor Man, these proteins are like spinach. These proteins help cells survive in locations where they would normally struggle. This gives us a lot of flexibility with where we can put these cells. And we are putting them in the forearm, right up our sleeves, just as I said. Now, this transplant protocol is actually in a proof of concept phase one, two clinical trial already. So, sensors and cells, that's pretty cool. And that foundational technology can be used for a whole lot of things. That's why I actually think it's really important that people that are impacted by conditions have a seat at the table and control and influence over the commercialization of promising novel biotechnologies. We don't have the hammer in hand and everything looks like a nail problem. We take these potent tools and we harness them in a way that's meaningful for our condition and for our community. And we work with urgency. There is nothing I would rather do with my life than work on creating the number one thing that I want to exist. There is no question type 1 diabetes has shaped me. You could argue I'm turning around and trying to shape it right back. Shape is too nice of a word. Reverse. Destroy. Eliminate. Now, this is the part of the talk where the speaker steps back and says, well, that's the idea anyway. Let's meet back here in 20 years, and I'll see if it works. I did not get into this field to reverse my diabetes when I'm 80. We have the foundational technology. We make insulin-producing cells in the lab every week. We know we can put sensors into cells and detect specific challenges from the immune system. We are able to transplant these cells and monitor them in tissue, and the ability to get cells to survive in the forearm, a new easy to administer site, is already in a phase one, two clinical trial. We have come a long way. And for the record, I don't care if we're first to develop a transplant relevant for all people living with type one. I just want it done. I want it in my body, I want it to work, I want it to be safe, and I want it to be accessible to those in my community who want to get it. If my team and I are a small part of making that a reality, I am honored. I'm not sitting here and telling you that this is just around the corner, but there has been so much progress and the speed of that progress is picking up. I can see it right before my eyes. And what I can guarantee is that my team and I are not gonna stop until this is done. And I have been known to come in right before the buzzer with a deep three-pointer. <laughs> Thank you.